Um, well, I'm honored to be uh, to be asked to be here, and, I, and it, it's it's uh, it's I sort of see it as coming full circle. Uh, I'm actually originally from Western Canada, and I um, I started as an undergraduate at the University of Alberta in animal science, uh, and spent two summers in 1983 and 1984 working for Willem Sauer. Some of you may know as a monogastric nutritionist um, at the time there. And uh, I spent my summers at a barn at the University of Alberta research farm, which is right in the middle of the city. Uh, the barn is called the Metabolic Barn. And I spent my nights sleeping on a cot in a room adjacent to the section of the barn where we housed our cannulated pigs, cannulated pancreatic juices and, uh, and iliocannulation, and we were doing digestion studies. Uh, anyway, besides the, the permanent scars from the pancreatic juice chewing through my fingers, um, I also have, I have psychological scarring because on the wall were the pictures of all the nutritional deficiencies as they used to do them, which is to completely remove the nutrient from the diet and see what happened. And I have visions of goose-stepping pigs. Um, this picture was from a, a prison somewhere in the southern U.S. where they were garbage-feeding pigs and cooking cooking the food waste and feeding it to the pigs, and apparently that can yield uh, panathenic acid deficiencies. Um, never would I know in the future that I would actually end up for a short time in the southern U.S. Uh, studying um, antibiotic resistance uh, on a prison farm that actually was in sole existence so that it could feed the food waste uh, to the pigs, albeit with correct nutritional supplementation. So, so I do have some small amount of, uh, of monogastric nutrition in my background, Although most of my work thus far has been on, um, on ruminants, uh, cattle, although I'm interested in, in all species, particularly with respect to the interface between animal agriculture uh, and human health. So today, um, I'm going to reverse the title a bit. I'm going to start with perspectives relating to antibiotics, try to keep it as current as I can, try to give you stuff that you probably haven't seen or heard about. Some of it's only a couple months old. In some cases, the reports may not even be written. Uh, obviously, the overview of the issue is that there are shared perspectives regarding the issue of antibiotic use, particularly as it relates to resistance among bacteria of food animal origin. And mostly we're talking about enteric bacteria, basically the bacteria that reside in the poop of the animal. Um, we have problems, though, because there's conflicting perspectives, uh, and we have problems interpreting these resistance data for what they mean and how we might manage this problem. I'll talk about some important developments that have occurred in the last couple of years at the international level, from the World Health Organization, from the European Union, here in the U.S. in terms of actions taken by the Food and Drug Administration. And I'll also talk about some of these emerging pathogens, whether or not it relates to resistance. Uh, you're probably reading about these in the newspaper almost every other day. And finally, I'll talk about some of the research that I'm involved with, uh, if we have time, talking about ways we might consider managing resistance by, by treating the, the bacterial population as a, as a target, um, using some microbial ecology principles. And finally, uh, look at what happens when we try to use alternatives to antibiotics, particularly as they relate to growth promotion, um, and how they might relate to antibiotic resistance themselves, even though they themselves are not antibiotics. So what do I mean by shared perspectives? I'm going to put up three statements that, in general, most people agree with, although you will find some that do not. First is that antibiotics are essential for enhancing health and well-being of both humans and animals. Some would like to add aquaculture. Okay? Most people won't disagree with that motherhood statement. The second is that, even though we disagree on the magnitude of it, most people can point to examples of overuse or misuse of antibiotics in both human and animal settings. Again, we're not all perfect, so there are examples and again, it just depends on the magnitude of the problem as you might see it. Third is that most people think there's value in protecting the efficacy of antibiotics for future generations and that this is a good thing to do. Some could say it's a public good, the idea that the bacteria are susceptible to the antibiotics we might want to treat them with. Other people say, what's a public good? So again, ideological differences, um, but in general, most people agree with three, three statements. Now, I. I find that there's value in actually starting with the sociology of this problem and then moving into the science because most of this problem is social. It's political, it involves morals, and it has to do with people's perspectives. So if you divide the economies, even though I'm going to get to the monetary economy last, and that's actually what the subject of the first talk was, 
We have to consider the political economy, and those are basically the infrastructure that involves how we regulate these products and or how we create incentives to develop and market new products in the form of regulations and patent law. The moral economy is actually how individual actors in a society make decisions. They have beliefs about the efficacy of these products and what they're useful for. They also have beliefs about the danger of using these products for certain uses. They have moral norms. They have drivers that say, I need to treat this sick animal or this sick person because I have a product in my toolbox that works. They have social norms. We are all cognizant of what others think about us and what others expect us to do. Okay? And finally, there's an issue of trust, particularly in competitive industries where some people say, well, I'm only going to use antibiotics prudently or I'm not going to use them at all. Others say, I'm going to do the same, but then they go ahead and do it. So there has to be trust and confidence in others to actually behave the way they say they're going to behave. And finally, of course, there are the monetary economics. People don't tend to do things that don't make economic sense. We're going to make, for the rest of this talk, the assumption that people are making economic decisions that are wise, whether or not that's true. We're going to focus instead on the differences that exist with respect to the political and the moral economies. So where do we get the conflicting perspectives? These are not my opinions. I'm going to give you some general statements that may reflect what some people who are concerned about antibiotic use in animal agriculture might be thinking. The first would be that human medicine takes precedence over veterinary medicine and animal agriculture. And if that's true, therefore, the precautionary principle would suggest that all but the most urgent uses in animals should be curtailed. And typically, they attack them in this order. They start with the use for growth promotion or non-therapeutic use of antibiotics. Then they move on to prophylaxis or prevention. Then they might move on to targeted, timed treatment to avoid epidemics. And the last thing they attack is therapy, which is interesting. Because most people won't argue about the animal welfare aspects and our moral obligation to treat sick animals when they're presented to us. But there's a problem with that assumption. That is that sick animals occur in the first place. There's another part to this, and that is that they will identify drugs that they deem to be critically important for human medicine and argue that they should be completely off the shelf and not available for animals. Now, there are some that haven't been ever approved such as the carbapenems, and probably never will be approved for animal uh, agriculture. But then we have some in the area where we have approval, and they overlap with the ones that people think are critically important. What we do about that is really the, the debate. So, for example, we have legislation that's been introduced several times, starting in 2009 by Louise Slaughter, PAMTA, you've probably heard about it, the acronym, which is this idea of restricting certain types or classes of antibiotic use to, res to preserve them for medical treatment. Just recently, some groups got frustrated waiting for the Food and Drug Administration to act, and so they sued the FDA, plus the Health and Human Services Secretary and the administrator in charge of the FDA for continuing to allow antibiotics for use in animals. So that's the reaction to perspectives such as what I presented. Now, the other Again, this isn't my opinion, I'm trying to put forward what some people might argue, is that we, in animal agriculture, have an obligation to provide safe, nutritious food at a reasonable price, and that this is actually a moral imperative. Okay? This may sometimes require judicious use of antibiotics. In this model, however, antibiotic therapy should be seen as a last resort, and in some cases, people would actually argue that it's a failure. Letting animals get sick, clinically ill, where they require treatment is actually a failure of the system. Okay, so we don't actually reserve the antibiotics for the worst case scenario. We try to prevent that. And prevention of clinical, subclinical infectious diseases actually improves both animal and human health by potentially reducing the number of pathogens finding their way uh, into the food supply. Now, I have done some sociological work with sociologists and social psychologists. I'm not one myself. Uh, and in one study, we actually surveyed veterinarians and feedlot operators. I know they're not swine uh, nutritionists, but we, we had a number of responses to questions about their beliefs, in particular about their moral duty to act in certain ways as regards antibiotic use. One of the questions we asked was, do you have a moral duty to treat an acutely ill animal? And overwhelmingly, something like 97% of both veterinarians and feedlot operators said that, yes, indeed, we have such a duty. 
That shouldn't surprise anybody. And in fact, this is the least controversial part of antibiotic use in agriculture. They don't differ. Now, if we ask them whether they have a moral duty to treat chronically ill cattle, these are basically the poor doers that don't get better despite repeated treatments, things start to look a little grayer. Now the majority of the operators who own the animals and are responsible to their shareholders and to the public think that they should continue to treat those animals. Interestingly enough, veterinarians don't agree as much about a moral duty. And when you dig into these data, it turns out most of that has to do with their lack of lack of belief in the efficacy of continuing to treat animals, frustrating cases, that it's not doing any good. Okay, so you start to see a difference of opinion despite people who are on the same side in animal agriculture. The third category has to do with what we call subtherapeutic or non-therapeutic antibiotics. These would be the growth promotion or in some senses a prophylactic use of antibiotics. The majority of operators who own the feedlot animals in the feedlots actually feel that it's a moral duty to use these products. The majority of veterinarians disagree. We now actually have two groups that diverge with respect to their their beliefs about their moral duty. This is not to say there are differences, that there are the same differences um, with expectations, what others might expect them to do. It's just that they differ with respect to their moral imperatives. So what I'm trying to introduce you to is the idea that this is actually not a simple problem, okay? I wouldn't be invited here if we were talking about future effectiveness of most pharmaceutical products. If I take a statin to lower my blood cholesterol, if I take a proton pump inhibitor to reduce my reflux, if I take a blood pressure lowering compound to lower my blood pressure, my use of that product doesn't affect anyone else's chances of having that product work, okay? But the anti-infectives are different, and this is what brings in this whole sort of complicating factor, where even though the, the model itself is not linear and it's not simple, the basic assumption is that one person's use of an antibiotic may diminish the effectiveness of another's future use of the same antibiotic in some small yet incremental way. This is really at the core of why this debate is going on, is whether you should use the antibiotic now when I might need it later. Okay? So now we get into risk management. What should we do about it? Okay? Well, the first part of getting to risk management is having some idea of the assessment of the risk quantifying the risk that we might face. And this is problematic because the data that we're working with aren't particularly well suited to the problem. And we have polar limits. Obviously, some people think that there's no problem and nothing should be done. And other people think there's a catastrophic problem and we need to do the most reactionary things to get rid of the problem. Okay? And I'm, I'm going to say, which is probably hearsay in this, off, hearsay in this, um, this audience, that Risk assessments that we use to evaluate a lot of things may not be particularly well suited to this problem. They're well suited for import risk assessments relating to pathogens, residues, toxic agents, but for something that's part of an adaptive process over a period of years and decades, it may not be the best approach. I'll explain why. So these data are from a study we did in 2007 uh, in the Panhandle of Texas and without getting into too much detail, the y-axis represents the proportion of E. coli in the gut of a, of a feedlot steer that are resistant to ceftiafur. This is the day of the study upon which uh, fecal samples were taken. And so what we do is if you have 100 E. coli, 80% or 80 of them up here were resistant on day 20. This is the group that received three sequential treatments of a particular antibiotic, which is called ceftiafur, a third-generation cephalosporin. This is a group where they only receive one dose, and this is the control group. Now, what's important to recognize are three things. That it doesn't start at zero, at least not in 2005 when the trial took place. That it never becomes 100%, okay? And that it is dose dependent. And finally, most importantly, and in most models, if you take it out to four weeks or beyond, recognizing this is a long-acting formulation, almost always it returns to the baseline, okay? So most contemporary risk assessments say there's no problem. So long as the animal doesn't escape from the farm or feces doesn't escape from the farm by day 28, we don't have a problem. You can send them to, you can send them to slaughter. Okay? So the differences we see are a rise in the proportion of bacteria that are resistant because we've treated and selected for them. But here's the rub. It actually turns out 
that most of the rise in the proportion of resistant bacteria has nothing to do with an expansion of the number of resistant bacteria. It has to do with the fact that we've killed off their competitors. We kill off the susceptible bacteria, or at least they're not able to grow on our culture medium. So in fact, we aren't really expanding the total number of resistant bacteria in the feces of these animals. We're instead killing off the ones that would otherwise outcompete them on the plates. Okay? So actually, that's a good thing. We're not expanding that population. We are a little bit, but mostly we're getting rid of the competition. We're making it appear to be problematic. So why do we care? In fact, most theories suggest that the use of these antibiotics in animal agriculture favor selection of resistant strains of bacteria, but it's only while they're being treated. Okay? So why don't we just not have a problem at all? Why don't we just move on to things? Well, the problem is this. Okay? They return to baseline. But over a two or three or four week period of most of our trials, you know, we can, only, we can only handle so much collecting feces from these animals. We can only do so much lab work. Um, but if you look at the actual time frame from approval of most of these products, and this is not to pick on this particular company, but the short acting formulation of the product was introduced in 1988 in both the US and Canada. In 96, a little bit longer formulation came out. 2003, a, a really long acting formulation came out. But what you see is that the antimicrobial resistance monitoring system assumes it was around 0% resistant in this time frame. Okay. Did I turn it off again? Okay. Uh, but what actually happens is you start to get creep. You start to get creep in the baseline. So that as we're doing these studies, and in fact we've done five sequential studies in feeder cattle arriving in this feed yard, experimental feed yard in the Panhandle of Texas, and every year the starting proportion goes higher and higher and higher. Yet our model will still show it goes back to baseline. This isn't easily captured in most quantitative risk assessments we deal with. Okay, so having given you the optimistic and then destroyed it with the pessimistic view of the problem we're facing, I want to talk about some of the contemporary things that are going on around the world that you need to be aware of. You may hear about them. I'm here to tell you what's going on. So in the last decade or so, what we've seen is that the World Health Organization started by convening a meeting of physicians, human doctors, in Canberra, Australia in 2005. In the short space of now six years, they have revised their list of critically important antibiotics for human medicine. And what typifies critical is that it basically is a last choice in many indications for treating human diseases for which there's no alternative. And the belief of these physicians is that these products need to be protected. Okay? Now, it's a work in progress. And so as human medicine continues to lose its weapons, I mentioned carbapenems, okay? We now have something you may have heard about called NDM1, which is the New Delhi met metallobetalactamase, which essentially has yielded bacteria that if you go as a medical tourist to India, you may contract, okay? Now, the Indian government is not very happy about this name because it isn't just restricted to the Indian subcontinent. And they've asked that it be changed. But for now, it's stuck. And basically, these are gram-negative enteric bacteria that have acquired resistance to almost all of the antibiotics that are known to humankind. There's a few that are left. Some of them are really old school antimicrobials that are also used in animal agriculture, the colistins, the polymyxins, okay? So what I'm telling you is that the, the work in progress can actually be fairly reactive in that as drugs become less and less useful for treating serious conditions in human medicine, they start to look further back the pipeline to identify other products that may be critically important. I'll also tell you that there's only three categories that the human doctors consider for antibiotics. There's critically important, there's very important, and there's important. And there's nothing less than important, okay? So you can argue with that. You can also see that there was immediate reaction to this by the World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, within two years came out with its own critically important list for veterinary medicine. And I'm not gonna argue with that approach, okay? Because clearly, somebody has to be willing to stand up and say, we need these products too. And we're getting conflicting in messages. You wanna get rid of old school antibiotics like tetracyclines, not make them available for treating large numbers of animals, 
But at the same time, you're going to take away the new weapons that we need to treat animals that are uh, clinically ill. So you're getting this sort of um, paradoxical uh, pressures. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this other than to say, if you want to go to the document, you can read all of the reasons, sorry, you can all read all the reasons of why it made it onto that list and the specific purposes um, to which they're trying to protect them. I'm going to give you the examples of three of the most critically important antimicrobials and how these classes are actually utilized in the US. First of all, you need to know that the human products are what are listed. They don't care about the veterinary analogs. Okay? So for instance, they're trying to protect fluoroquinolones. They're trying to protect, for example, ciprofloxacin, but we don't use ciprofloxacin in, in animal agriculture in the US. But that doesn't matter because we do have an, an animal analog, enrofloxacin. So the CIA list is targeting that product. Likewise, in terms of third and fourth generation cephalosporins, we don't use ceftriaxone, which they're trying to protect for use for treating children with salmonellosis. Okay? I mean, these are worthy causes. We only have, at this point, ceftiofur in the US. The Europeans have fourth generation cephalosporins like cefquinone. The FDA has refused to approve that product in the US thus far. Finally, we have macrolides. And everybody says, how did the macrolides get on this list? The macrolides are on this list solely because you can get invasive campylobacteriosis in children, and you can't use fluoroquinolones in children. So this is all that's available to treat invasive campylobacter disease in children. Now, macrolides include erythromycin in, in, in human medicine and also in animal agriculture, but the key one that you're probably mostly familiar with is tylosin, which a very large company that's based in this city um, also markets. Okay, So of these three, these are for injectable treatment of of animals, whether they be for therapy or control. Um, this is available also in injectable form, but it's the only one on the list that's currently a feed grade product. No, oh, I did it again. Okay, so the weird thing is, I got on a plane in Oslo, Norway after attending the meeting at the WHO about this new revision, and the Independent, which is a British new newspaper, had this article, front page, saying that the use of critically important antibiotics per the WHO had soared in the UK from 2000 to 2009 despite a drop in the numbers of animals that are actually being produced. And they, they plotted, something's going on, they plotted the increase in the use of cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, and macrolides. And the point of this was to say that there's a problem going on in UK agriculture that needs to be fixed and it relates to in their view, overuse and misuse of these products. And they're focusing now on the CIAs. OK, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in swine and other species in the US regarding the third and fourth generation cephalosporins. First of all, it's a third generation cephalosporin. It's been around for 22 years or so. It's increased in its, its um, enhancements, if you will, for longer duration. In the US, it's coded by the AMPC plasmid. You don't need to know that other than to know that there's a particular gene called the BLAS CMY2, the beta lactamase gene, that is the only thing in the US thus far that's of importance for coding resistance. In Europe, it's a completely different story. They have some of this, but they also, also have what they call extended spectrum beta lactamases, the TEMs and the CTXMs, that we thus far, knock on wood, don't have in the US. Okay. Again, the chief public health concern is not that they're injecting children with ceftifure, but that ceftriaxone needs to be kept as a viable alternative to treat illnesses. Now, before you freak out, this is ceftifure resistance among swine seminella isolates from the US National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System. The y-axis is not constant across these graphs. This ranges from 0 to 20%. But if you look carefully, and I apologize, gray was not a great color. I used it for the black and white proceedings. Um, the gray color, which is the lower line, actually represents a really pretty good scenario for swine salmonella. It's the lowest of the major commodity groups at slaughter. What, um, what isn't so good is this black line represents the salmonella isolates from animals submitted to diagnostic labs, typically state diagnostic labs, and they're actually very high, up to 20%. And what that is, is that probably these animals went in with salmonellosis. There's a better than even chance they may have had prior treatment, which shouldn't be going on necessarily with slaughter animals, 
And so we do expect, particularly that the strains that cause clinical illness in swine are more likely to be resistant than those may be picked up on random sampling at slaughter. So that's actually a success story. I contrast that, now the y-axis has switched from 0 to 100% with tetracycline resistance among salmonella isolates in the US, again from NARMS. You'll notice that from 80 to 90% of the isolates of salmonella at D-labs are resistant to tetracycline, and something from 50 to 65% of the salmonella at slaughter are resistant to tetracycline. But notice that it hasn't changed a bit over the last 25 years. It's flat, okay? Now you may again say, well, that's a success story, or is that a saturation point for tetracycline resistance? Certainly, the thing I always ask myself when I hear people who want to ban feed-grade antimicrobials like chlorotetracycline is, what do you expect is going to happen? Do you think this number is going to go down? It isn't going to go down. It's not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay perfectly flat. Now, the composition of the bacteria yielding that phenotype of tet resistance may change, but if you're expecting a response to your intervention or your risk management strategy, you're going to fool yourself and everybody else, okay? Now, this is comparing, now the black line represents cattle, which is probably the worst we have right now in terms of at slaughter salmonella resistance to ceftiafur. Second most would be the broilers. And again, swine are looking the best here, somewhere less than 5%. So what's the difference? Well, really, it comes down, I'm going to skip through this quickly, but it comes down to this, which is that when ceftiafur resistance occurs, it only occurs when there's, this is on the y-axis, the number of antimicrobials to which a strain is resistant. And this is where we have 8, 9, 10, or even 11 resistances in one bacterium out of 15. Okay. So ceftiafur resistance only occurs amongst multi-drug resistant strains, which is a bad thing, okay? But tet resistance occurs all the way up to the top of this Christmas tree, even to the point where it occurs by itself, okay? Now, we'd all like our bacteria to be pan-susceptible, but that's not reality anymore, okay? But, but low-level, single, double, or even triple resistant tetracycline is surely an improvement over this. And I might add that the recent multi-drug resistant Salmonella Heidelberg out of Turkey, the ground meat recall of all recalls, was only resistant to streptomycin, sulfamethoxazole, and tetracycline. Heidelberg can have really bad safety for resistance. This one didn't, okay? But it was, it was put forward as a multi-drug resistant strain, and that made it a worst case scenario for many people. Okay? Now, why is, why is it that pigs are relatively low? It has really a lot to do with the dominant serovar. The salmonella type that's in the pigs is the biggest thing that affects what we're looking at. Now, typically most of these species have a salmonella serovar that affects them and nobody else. Dublin is it for cattle. Kentucky is it for broilers. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, it's one of these two for, for swine. But if you look at it, swine have relatively few. These are the asterisks that are actually ceftiafur resistant strains. Cattle have, we've had an outbreak recently of typhimurium in Newport, and that has driven the high levels of ceftiafur resistance in cattle. So knock on wood, again, the serovars that are dominant in swine at slaughter don't tend to be the ones that have ceftiafur resistance. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of quick updates on what's going on in Europe and other emerging food safety issues, and then I'll talk about some of the research we're doing looking at maybe managing resistance better. Most of you may know that the European Union banned the use of antibiotics as growth promoters in 2006, but there was a, there was a snowball effect that probably began in the mid-1980s and even earlier, starting with the Swan Report out of the UK in 1969. The Swedes stopped using them in, I think, 1986, and the Danes banned them in 1996. So a lot of the long-term data we have on the effects of that ban actually come from those two countries. Now this is a graph that's been pulled from an American Journal of Vet Research article in 2009 by Frank Airstrup et al. Frank has been a leading proponent of, of the actions that have been taken in Denmark. Um, and Denmark is quite unique in terms of the country, both in terms of the construct of its swine industry and other commodity groups, and in their sort of, if you will, the cooperative spirit to actually engage in some of these activities. So beginning back in 1994, the first thing they did was took away the profit motive for veterinarians to sell antibiotics. And if you look 
the division is the gray bars are therapeutic antibiotic use and the black bars are growth promotion. Didn't see much drop in the antibiotic growth promotion, but there was a drop in the amount of therapeutic antibiotics being prescribed. Then they put a ban on antibiotic growth use in finishing pigs, along with a Virginia mycin ban. Uh, the Abel Parson ban, I should also mention, started back in 95. And again, they saw a drop, but not until the product was essentially gone when the AGP use was banned in weaning pigs did you see the complete cessation of this. And then over the past number of years, there's been an increase in therapeutic use. There's been any number of people that have dissected this problem from their own perspective. I know Scott Hurd, who's spoken here before, went to Denmark and looked through these data carefully. And different people interpret them differently in terms of their effect on the swine industry in Denmark. Okay, I apologize for this graph, but this comes out of the same paper. And basically, the gist of, of Airstrip's argument is that um, the total number of swine, the number of, of pigs weaned per sow, um, and other measures have actually improved over that time period. The only brief reduction they saw here was an average daily gain around the time of the ban, and then it crept up, and a spike in mortality that since has come down. Now, he can't stand up there and say that all of the swine farms and swine farmers fared equally or did well at all. But he can say that the industry as a whole did adapt to the situation. And if you believe the statistics, essentially they say that the, the Danish swine industry has moved on. In the US, we don't have this. But sometimes we get some surprises. So in July 2008, this final rule, again, I apologize for the size of this, but you can you can look it up yourself uh, in the, in the uh, Federal Register, the FDA issued a final rule that was going to ban extra-label use of cephalosporins, which means that a veterinarian can't go on a farm and say, you can use this product for this condition that it's not on the label. Okay? Banned it. Now, there was such an uproar from industries, probably including the swine industry, but also the cattle industry and the, and the broiler industry, that this final rule has been on hold now for going on three plus years. We keep hearing it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But thus far, it has not. What brought this on was actually a survey that the FDA did. And they've redacted the names of the chicken broiler hatcheries. But they did a survey of how many of these hatcheries were using Innovo injection of either Ceftiofur or Gentamicin, basically injecting the eggs because they're easier to inject a day before they're hatched than the chicks are to catch and inject as well. So high levels of Ceftiofur use back in 2004. And in Quebec, they discovered that Salmonella Heidelberg were becoming very, very highly resistant to Ceftiofur because of this practice, it was believed. They banned the practice, and immediately the levels of Ceftiofur resistance dropped. I believe that the FDA saw this, felt that that was indication that they should take action, because this is an extra label use of that product in broiler hatcheries, and banned it. Now, a couple of things that we have to take note of is that Salmonella Heidelberg, unlike the Salmonella typhimurium in the Newport that I talked to you about being linked in multi-drug resistant strains, was only linked to ampicillin. It did not have that ACSSUT, ampicillin, chloramphenicol, streptomycin, sulfamethoxazole, tetracycline phenotype that we see in most other species. I believe that actually allowed it to drop off more precipitously. The other thing is that we actually saw an interesting reciprocal response, which is to say if you focus on this graph here, which is where Quebec is, looking on the y-axis is the percentage of isolates resistant to a certain pattern. The drop-off in the blue and the magenta lines is actually ceftifur and ampicillin, but we see an increase, a reciprocal increase in streptomycin and tetracycline, which is precisely the MDR phenotype that was in the ground turkey meat Salmonella Heidelberg that was recently the focus of the Cargill recall. Okay. Now I'm going to breeze through quite quickly this, these other issues, but you, you probably read about these as well. A cynic would say that scientists go into retail meat outlets, take a bunch of samples, plate them for different bacteria, find them, and then say that's the next scourge of food safety. That then creates a situation for other researchers such as myself to go in and get grants and then look and see if this is actually the case. But in many instances, the damage has already been done. In some cases, it's potentially a real problem. So you need to be aware of these. The first is vancomycin-resistant enterococci, which has been a problem in the European Union, largely because they had a product called Avoparsin that was marketed there. 
uh, for a decade or so that never made its way into the U.S. market. There's also something called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, clonal complex, or sequence type 398, which has been a real problem in Europe, and in particularly the Netherlands has done a bang-up job of investigating this very, very seriously. It turns out it isn't a food safety issue, but initially many people were putting it forward as such. And finally, the question is whether some of these environmental anaerobes like Clostridium difficile that can cause real havoc in human hospitals could actually be a foodborne pathogen. And I know that both the USDA and the National Pork Board have been funding research to look at these two in particular. Um, this has sort of been on the back burner because we've assumed that it wasn't in the US, but it turns out that if you look for it, you probably can find it. So VRE on the left is basically a graph that shows when the antibiotic growth promotion ban went in place in, in Denmark, saw precipitous drop off in erythromycin resistance, vancomycin resistance, and so the problem was solved. Abel Parson was off the market, Tylosin was off the market, um, and Airstrip puts this forward as belief that, that these bans can be effective. Okay? Now, I hope you can see that back there, but this paper just came out two years ago, which says that spread without a known selective pressure of a vancomycin-resistant clone of E. facium among broilers is going on in Sweden. Sweden hasn't used antibiotic growth promotion since 1986, and yet VREs are continuing to rise gradually. They need to use selective media to get them, but they're going up and up and up. Now, VREs aren't a problem to you or I or healthy people sitting in the audience, but they're a horrible thing to happen to people that are in a human hospital, okay? So we don't want VREs. The question is, what could be going on that could be selecting for VRE in agriculture in the absence of antibiotic use? One thing we decided to do is to look in a very uniquely integrated system in Texas um, at a population that was separated into groups, those that worked with swine, those that had no access occupationally to swine, and then the pigs themselves. Now, we never had any trouble getting access to the pig fecal samples, but we had to do some innovative things to get access to the human fecal samples, so we worked with wastewater. Okay? So I was like this Dilbert cartoon, uh, which is when, when the boss is trying to get Wally to learn to send data through some innovative means, whether it be the power grid or whatever, to actually start sending the data through the sewer system. And I'm here to tell you, you can actually find a lot of useful data in sewer systems. What we did is actually looked using selective media for vancomycin-resistant enterococci in human and swine populations in an integrated population, assuming we'd find it in both, and that we could determine the clonality and the shared carriage of this bacteria between those that worked with the pigs and those that didn't. Now, unlike the European experience with methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, we actually never found VRE in swine. Yay for U.S. agriculture, okay? And that's been the dogma. We don't have it in the U.S. They have a fair bit of it in Europe, even after they're banned. We don't have it, okay? Now, the problem is that if you start looking for it and you look for it in enough places, you may find it. And so there are examples where we've used serious enrichment We've teased out that ba those bacteria. We've given them the best possible chance of showing their hands. And we have now found VRE in swine in three Michigan counties at shows. It turns out it's a clonal complex five, which is a European complex. So it, somehow those European strains got their way into Michigan. And we've also now found in Ohio these extended beta-lactamases that we didn't have in the US or thought we didn't have in the US that they have in Europe. So just because we think they aren't here, they aren't here at a prevalent rate, but they, um, they may become a problem in the future. MRSA, I'll just, I'm just gonna quickly talk about MRSA. You'll hear about it in the news all the time. People get it on wrestling mats, football players get it in the NFL. Uh, Community-based MRSA is a scourge. It used to all be in the hospital, okay? So now the question is, if we have particular clonal types that are found in the nares of pigs, Okay, so Tara Smith at Iowa, University of Iowa, has been the pioneer in this area. And sure enough, you can find it in pigs in the U.S. You can find it in the nasal um, passages of, of swine workers, vets, vet students, and so on. Um, but the EU has concluded that it is not a food safety risk. It is an occupational risk. And you might think, well, that's not a problem for me, except that probably a lot of people in this room actually are interacting with swine on a regular basis. So what you need to know about it 
is that in the EU, the dominating type is this ST or sequence type or clonal complex 398. In Asia, it's ST9. It doesn't cause any animal health problems. It can create a human carrier state. It tends to cure as they move away from the constant exposure. And in the Netherlands, who have done the most with this, they've actually enacted strict infection control procedures. Okay? Basically, farmers that have to be admitted to a hospital are treated differently than the main population. They are quarantined, they are segregated, they are decolonized before they're allowed to be on the same wards with other patients. This has created, potentially, a threat for the individual. It's increased the costs, and so it's actually become a, more than just an inconvenience in that situation. Um, I'm just going to quickly skip over Clostridium difficile. You may hear about it. We did a study in the same population in Texas, the same unique population. Um, and we found that swine and humans harbor almost all the same type, toxinotype 5, of this bacterium. This bacterium, toxinotype 5, 5, does not cause any problems. It's everywhere. It's in the environment. It's probably more of a common point source. Some people say if you find that in your food, in retail meat at the store, it means it's a foodborne pathogen. I'm here to say that it's everywhere. But the one that you don't want to have, which is toxinotype 3, which we only found in four situations with four human samples, which has a deletion in the TCDC gene. You don't need to know what that does. But that basically regulates the production of the toxin. That deletion means that this bacterium just produces toxin like crazy. You get that bacteria in you as a human, it's bad news. Okay? But we don't have it in the swine. So again, you hear about Clostridium difficile. Be reserved and say there is no evidence at this point to suggest this is a foodborne pathogen that I need to be worried about. Okay? Uh, just skip through this. Okay, I'm running time. Okay. Um, five more minutes. So I'm going to talk about a couple of optimistic studies that we did. So I'm an eternal optimist. If I sound like I'm a pessimist, I'm trying not to be gloom and doom epidemiologist like economists. Um, we, I once went to an American Society of Microbiology meeting in Copenhagen. At the end of the meeting, I was given the Wiley Coyote Award, which I wasn't sure if that was an honor or a raspberry award. And they said it was because I was willing to jump off that cliff, have an anvil land on my head, and then walk away like an accordion and go back and do it again. So, so I don't learn from my mistakes, but hopefully each mistake is a little better than the last one. So I'm going to describe the mistake that we saw. It, it turns out it was probably an artifact, but at the moment it suggested there might be a way to intervene by using one antibiotic against another. It turns out it was an artifact in the data, and we need to be careful of these artifacts. So what we saw, this is a very busy graph, but essentially we're looking at tetracycline resistance in a chlortetracycline untreated group. And if you look over a 28-day study period, that's each of the sampling days, it stayed pretty constant at about 60% resistance to tetracycline. In this group, and where we put tetracycline in for three batches of five days each, we saw an increase in tetracycline resistance. What you would expect. In the, now this is not the same scale, so it's capping out at about 20%. In the control group that didn't receive chlortetracycline, we saw some variation in ceftiafur resistance, the third generation cephalosporin. But what we were really struck by was that ceftiafur resistance disappeared completely during the time when chlorotetracycline was in the feed. Okay? So this is when the anvil hit my head. What we thought was, okay, chlorotetracycline expands the tetracycline resistant fraction, but if you think about the Christmas tree, there's a lot of tet resistant strains that aren't ceftiafur resistant. And if you think about relative fitness, if we're expanding another fraction of the resistant bacteria and not the ones that are multi-resistant, wouldn't that be a good thing? Well, I'm in academia, so I'm allowed to pursue those type of questions. So what we did is did a, a nice, I think, two by two factorial design where we were interested not only in how many animals out of the pen were receiving the exceed, which is ceftiafur, but also what was the effect of putting chlortetracycline in the feed afterwards. So. Because of the labeling of the product at, at the therapeutic dose, we would only put it in for five-day blocks with a day off in between. We gave exceed after the first sampling on day zero. We waited till day four, which is what we expected to be the peak resistance to ceftiafur. And we put the chlortetracycline in, and we thought that resistance might go away again. 
We used two methods. We used phenotypic methods, one which was based on spiral plating or counting the number of colonies that were either susceptible or resistant. And what we saw was exactly what I showed you before in the graph, which is that these are non-type specific E. coli. When you give exceed to every animal in the pen, you kill off two logs of susceptible bacteria. You're killing a lot of bacteria with that injection. Okay? And what happens if, when you, if you don't put chlorotetracycline in the feed, it returns pretty much to normal. And it may, depending on the mind's eye, go up a little faster when you put chlorotetracycline in the feed. Okay? What happens in the group as a whole is if you just give one animal exceed, you don't see much of an effect. Now, tetracycline, when we put tetracycline in the media, we actually see a fairly rapid rise in recovery of the CTC, or the tetracycline-resistant fraction, after you put it in, which makes sense. We're allowing it to expand at the expense of the susceptibles. We, it's particularly dramatic when only one animal in the pen gets exceed. You put chlortetracycline in, there's this massive explosion that we didn't see otherwise. But here's the rub. I already mentioned to you that safety fear resistance only occurs in the multi-drug resistant phenotypes. When 100% of the animals get uh, exceed and none get exceed, uh, get CTC, there's a slight rise uh, in the fraction that is resistant to ceftiofur or tet cef. So that should say cef or ceftet. And the same over here. But when you put chlortetracycline in the feed, you get this massive expansion of the fraction that are ceftiofur resistant. So our first assumptions were false, and the question is, why were the data telling us what they were? It's really exemplified here when only one animal in the pen gets exceed. Okay, so there's no expansion of the group, but the chlortetracycline is expanding the fraction that are ceftiofur resistant. Now the difference between this and the previous study is that we use selective media. We put the antibiotic in the plate to allow the bacteria to not have to compete with the other bacteria. Okay. So we also did one other thing, which is to use metagenomic approaches to actually quantify the gene copies. Knowing there's one gene coding for, for resistance, we use the BLAH CMY2 gene with a standard curve and a qPCR approach. And basically, you see the curve that looked just like the, the paper from Platt, okay, fairly flat. When you put CTC in, you see this rise Okay, this is every animal with pen receiving exceed, and there's a rise, and then a gradual tapering. The most dramatic thing, though, is when only one animal receives exceed, it's sort of flat, and putting chlortetracycline in the feed causes a massive explosion in the production of the gene that codes for safety fear resistance. So, despite my optimism that chlortetracycline could help solve our safety fear resistance problem, it doesn't appear to work that way. I'm going to close with talking about copper. And I know our next speaker is talking about a, a cation zinc. Um, but there's been a fair bit of interest in the use of copper as an alternative to antibiotic um, growth promotants. And we've, the, work, the group that I'm working with, including some that you'll probably recognize, including Mike Tokach and uh, Jim Nelson and Steve Dreitz uh, at K-State, um, had previously looked at just putting copper in feed and the effects on selecting for copper-resistant enterococci. We thought, well, OK, what about if, if copper selects for copper resistance, it may also select for other things. But what happens if we add antibiotics such as chlortetracycline and tylosin? Does that actually have a synergistic effect, an additive effect, or what? Now, the thing you need to know that makes it interesting is that the copper resistance, which is TCRB, transmissible copper resistant gene B, is housed on a large plasmid along with ERM B, which stands for erythromycin gene B and TET-M, which is the M gene. There's lots and lots of genes in tetracycline resistance. It's transferable via conjugation. So we know this plasmid can move from bacterium to bacterium, both within the pig gut and maybe in the human gut. Okay? So if you see that, back in old school microbiology, somebody says, well, if I, put if I put copper in the feed, I should get an expansion of copper resistance, but also of TET and tylosin resistance. Or if I put tylosin in the feed, I should get an expansion of TET and copper resistance. Okay? Now, in Europe, that thing looks just like this. They haven't looked for TET, but there's another gene in there. It's called VAN-A. VAN-A codes for vancomycin resistance. Really, really bad news. Think back to the broilers in Sweden. Haven't used antibiotics since 1986. But 
it's allowed in organic operations to actually use microminerals at higher than NRC values. In this case, we used 125 parts per million in the feed in a segregated early weaning facility, and we used a, a three by three, but incomplete design because we're not allowed to mix Tylosin with CTC um, to evaluate the effects and the interactions of these. Now, this is, I know this is the worst graft I could ever show to a bunch of animal scientists. <laughs> I apologize. I don't do gro growth studies, so these aren't average daily gain, these aren't feed efficiency. These are just the weights over the 35 days of the study. We measured them on day zero. We put the feeds in either copper alone, a control, copper and tylosin, copper and CTC, or tylosin or CTC by themselves. And we measured the weights of the pigs. We adjusted for pen effects. And I know you can't see it, but it turns out that despite the fact that we took the, the we took all the treatments out at day 21, that the group that received copper and CTC did by far the best. CTC was a close second, and copper was a close third. Okay, this is just in the growth over the study period. The differences started to diminish after we took the, the product out of the feed. And again, even though these are expansive confidence intervals because of the number of isolates we got at each time, on the left, I showed you the line of resistance proportion to TCRB. I should tell you that every time it was copper resistant, it was also erythromycin and TET resistant. Likewise, it went the other way, okay? So basically, we saw some impact of CTC as well as a mild impact of, of tylosin, not significant there, but CTC certainly reached some significance by late week four, late week five, in the absence of copper. But when you add copper to um, CTC and to tylosin, we get an, actually more of an expansion than what we'd expect for simply selecting for the same plasmid. So there is actually an additive effect. We wouldn't have expected any effect. We wouldn't have expected an additive effect for that sort of selection process. So, I, what I've tried to do with this talk is give you an introduction to some of the issues, um, the perspective in terms of a political, moral economy and belief systems. I've talked about some of the worldwide and national issues that you're going to face, some of the approaches that a, a, a Wiley Coyote Award winner has tried to attempt to understand interventions that might be used in resistance. Um, I'd like to close by the, with this, this uh, emblem, which is actually the original emblem from Kansas State University when it was Kansas State uh, College of Agriculture and Mechanical Sciences. In the middle, you probably can't read it from the back, it basically says, rule by obeying nature's laws. And I actually really like this. I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit aggressive, uh, you know, but on the other hand, it actually spe it says a lot about how we should approach questions like um, resistance, where nobody is an expert, Anybody who professes to actually know everything there is about resistance, you can call a phony, okay? Some of us know a little bit more than others, uh, but, but it's actually a really humbling experience to work with these bacteria and realize how little you know. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. If there is any time, I realize there isn't much, uh, and thank you for your attention.